Okay. Um, so, as I said before, today's discussion is going to be on Siddhartha Gautama's Bodhi, his awakening, and it's the commemoration that we do every year. Um, and so, just keep in mind when we do this that part of the, I, I think of it like if we were a Christian tradition, we might be reading the night before Christmas, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, which is, which is somebody's reading it in a very centurion voice. Well, I can't be centurion, but uh, I, I think that this should be an occasion in which it is a little bit more um, that sort of thing. It's, it's because there's the hagiography, which is based upon a legend, which is based upon uh, traditions. And so just to let you know, I'll be reading it for the most part. And so <clears throat> to begin, if you remember hearing this before, you have. <laughs> uh, that's part of the reason who we observe Jodawe, which is also called Rawatsu, uh, Shaka Jodawe in, in Japanese or Rawatsu. Rawatsu is the, the, typically the Zen term, and Jodawe is the a more vernacular term that's used. Um, and by observing this, we have... Uh, an opportunity, I think, that's that's important to be reminded about this this figure of Shakyamuni Buddha, his awakening, which is really the story of why we revere him. And so, in that sense, um, we we want to do it in a way that's respectful. And at the same time, what can we learn from this? So it's not exactly the same as I've done in the past, because I make little bit of little changes. But the three things that I want to talk about this evening, one is the meaning of Bodhi, awakening. The second is the context for awakening. What, what, how did it arise? Why did it arise? And what does this have to do with us? And I say that specifically for Chip, who's sitting in the back, because um, inevitably, when I get to the end, I say, are there, are there any questions? He will say, yeah, but what's that got to do with me? <laughs> so ju I, I just, that's just a, um, a preventative. Um, <laughs> so according to Akira, the definition of Buddhist enlightenment is seeing things as they actually are. And this suggests a dynamic nature of Buddhist enlightenment, not as a metaphysical or a magic change, which I think that, when we hear the legend, that's often the way we hear it. Um, but it's not a state of going from the ordinary to a superhero. But it's something that was done by a person that is not unlike any of us sitting here. Well... Once he attained awakening, he was a bit different. But at the time that he started, he was pretty much similar. And, and I think that from my perspective, the similarity about that is really interesting because he lived in a time, Shakyamuni Buddha lived in a time in which he was, he lived, a, as you'll discover, a very affluent lifestyle being brought up in as the the first child of the uh, ruler of a small kingdom. Um, so you can imagine the kind of life he would have lived contrasted with everyone else who lived in the kingdom. But we all live, everyone here lives a relatively affluent life. And that's one of the things we, we seem to forget. Anyone, I, I have personally have never gone to India, but I've certainly heard of, from people who have been to India and I've seen pictures of India and their everyday life is, for the average person, and is pretty, well, not great. And even if you're in Europe in the, uh, you know, 500 BCE, what was your life like in Europe at that time? It had been pretty... By, by our standards, it would be pretty, uh, 
what's the right term? A very difficult bleak. Bleak is the term I was looking for. Yeah, bleak and 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 uh, but he didn't he didn't have that. So we have to keep that in mind. And there's a hagiography of the historical Buddha's enlightenment, which is important. And I think the hagiography, and that's why I include it in, in part of what we're going to do, because it is sort of like the night before Christmas. It gives us a sense of feeling, a sense of place, a sense of uh, community by listening to those words at various times. And I think that that becomes really important. I, I, you know, the Buddhist modernists really tried to sort of scale back on some of that. And, and I think that we really need to incorporate it because that's part of what gives us a sense of place and sense of meaning. So I'll do some of the didactic first. <clears throat> and, and that's to provide a framework for enlightenment. In Hinduism, there's a term moksha, which is loosely translated as liberation from maya, maya or worldly desires. And once a person attains moksha, they are freed from the cycle of birth and rebirth. And keep in mind that this is coming from the Vedic, not from the Buddhist perspective. So this is specifically in what we refer to uh, in the States as Hinduism. When free from troubles that are part of our daily lives, moksha leads a person to anand, which is eternal bliss. Wow. Let's go for eternal bliss. You know, I'm, I'm all for that. <laughs> um, that's what a person experiences when they're united with the universal God, Brahman. I'm not sure that I would go there. And a brief footnote here to insert that this was a view that was widespread, not only in India at this time, but it was a view, the, the idea of, of moksha, that was throughout Nepal, Southern Asia, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Thailand, etc. So this wasn't just the Indian continent. You see that in all of Western Asia and South Asia. And the worldview of an individual or society was based upon this notion of enlightenment at the time of Shakyamuni Buddha. So there was that, that idea of enlightenment at that time. He didn't come up with the concept. That was a concept that was already there. He put a spin on it, but he didn't invent the, invent the idea. So that's where we want to start. And keep in mind, because it's important in our understanding of Shakyamuni Buddha and his writings, in the early writings about what enlightenment is. We see a change that takes place when we go from the Pali Canon to the Sanskrit Canon, from the uh, what we now refer to as Theravada to the Mahayana. Um, but the Pali Canon was being written with this idea of enlightenment looking in a specific fashion. So in the Pali Canon, which is developed in the Tamra Satvaya of Sri Lanka, that was a specific group which later led to the Theravadan tradition. The Theravadan tradition really didn't develop until the 17th century. So there were many different groups that, that developed until that time. Um, we find these stories of Shakyamuni Buddha in their sutra, and we find it elaborated more in Jataka tales and other commentary. And Bodhi refers to the realization of the four stages of enlightenment and becoming an arhat. In Theravada Buddhism, Bodhi is equal to supreme insight, the realization of the Four Noble Truths, which leads to an end of samsara, and this is equivalent to nirvana. And nirvana is literally the blowing out or the quenching of activity of the grasping mind and its related unease that's involved. And it means the release of the 10 fetters or the 10 hindrances. That's specifically which, what are we referring to. And while alive, the Buddha enters into a condition, what I'll use in Chinese terms, entered into a conditional nirvana. And at death, he enjoys the peace of complete nirvana 
and escapes from the cycle of rebirth and the dissolution of self in the Pali Canon. For Buddha, after destroying the disturbances of the mind and attaining concentration of the mind, he attained the three knowledges of the Daya. And those are insight into his past lives, insight into the workings of karma and reincarnation, and insight in the Four Noble Truths. So those are the three things that he gained, according to the Pali Canon, that he gained upon his awakening. Insight into his past lives, insight into the workings of karma and reincarnation, and insight into the Four Noble Truths. And I want to address that second one for a moment. Insight into the workings of karma and reincarnation. Here you can clearly see where the Vedic texts were had an influence on uh, Buddhism as it was at the time and still does because the concept of karma is as relevant today as it was 2,500 years ago. Um, the idea of reincarnation we would now refer to as rebirth as opposed to reincarnation, but the idea is, is similar. Or is it awakening? The Sanskrit word bodhi is translated as both enlightenment and awakening. In Mahayana Bodhi Buddhism, bodhi, the bodhi is associated with perfection of wisdom or shunyata, and the teaching that all phenomena are empty of self-essence. This is reality. That's the nature of reality. We're going to keep going back to Akira's notion of what is Buddhism. And I'll use my term, it's the search for the nature of reality. In Mahayana thought, the Bodhi is the realization of the inseparability of samsara and nirvana and the unity of subject and object. That's reality. That's the reality we're talking about. It's that realization. This wasn't discussed so much in the Pali Canon. You find elements of it and it's hinted at here and there, but you don't really find it elucidated. <clears throat> the Bodhisattva, the enlightened being who remains in the phenomenal world to bring all enlightenment is the ref is reflects the reality that none of us is separate. That becomes really important. <clears throat> So the idea of individual enlightenment in the Mahayana context is an oxymoron. Because from a bodhisattva perspective, one can only receive full awakening, full enlightenment, when all sentient beings are awakened. That's why we say at the beginning of the six of the four bodhisattva vows, sentient beings are numberless. I vow to save them. The, the subtext of that would be, otherwise, I don't get mine. <laughs> That's something we got to remember, you know. It's, it's not totally altruistic. It sounds altruistic, but it's not totally altruistic because I can't get it until you get it. That's a bummer. Um, where am I here? Okay. In the topic of the Garba, can I ask a question? Oh, yes. Go if, ahead. if one cannot achieve enlightenment, and thus we all do, then how did Bodhisattva achieve enlightenment? It's clearly a lot of us would not there yet. Okay. Uh, let me, let me do, give you a really quick answer to that. And that is, we're talking about Samyak Sambodhi, Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, complete supreme enlightenment, which is different from being a, a sort of cumulative enlightenment that we get as we go along in this life that that's one of the that's that's one of the things that, that we often don't talk about is that one can reach an awakening and a little bit more awakening and a little bit more awakening but the idea of anuttara samyak sambodhi the supreme unexcelled awakening doesn't come until all sentient beings have attained awakening is that Thank you. Okay. Um, in the Mahavirachana Sutra, Bodhi is the final goal of the Bodhisattva career. 
It's pure universal in immediate knowledge, which extends over time, all universes, all beings and elements, conditioned and unconditional. It's absolute and identical with reality, and thus it is the Tathagata. Bodhi is immaculate and non-conceptual, and it being not an not an other object cannot be understood by discursive thought. It has neither beginning, nor middle, nor end, and it is indivisible. So where does that leave us with Siddhartha Gautama's and his awakening? Six years before sitting under the Bodhi tree, and here's where I begin to, to, to read for sure. Um, <clears throat> this is important because I maintain that this was the training, the six years that he spent as a shamana. This is the training in what to do and what not to do that prepared him for his awakening. And sometimes we think about why it's important to know what to do, but sometimes it's equally important to know what not to do. And that's one of the reasons why we say, even in Buddhism, even a bad teacher can be a kind of gem because that bad teacher may have taught you what not to do. <laughs> so just keep this important. So he starts as a shramana, an ascetic. And the short story is that Siddhartha Gautama left home against his parents and his wife's will in the middle of the night. He mounted his favorite horse and with this Chair and with a charitor, they left the palace secretly. And according to the Pali Canon, he left he left his home to seek good. That's the way it's referred to. He gave his clothes to the charitor and exchanged his clothes. And he put on he shaved his head. He put on robes and he set out for the kingdom of Magda to the south, the home of many groups of mendicants. And here's where we have a number of different tales. All of them are perfectly correct. None of them are evidentiary or inassailably factual. The hagiography, the legend, the good intentions all lead us to a useful outline. At Vasali, Gautama found a learned aesthetic, Arata Kalama, who taught a method of one-pointed concentration, deep meditation. The meditation was on the sphere of nothingness. That sounds like it's not so far from Shunyata. After he had attained the teaching, he was asked to remain and teach others, but he realized that he had not yet found what he was seeking. In Rajgara, Bhaktama found another religious sage, Rudraka Brahmaputra, and taught him, who taught him much as Kalma had, except that he taught him to go beyond the sphere of no nothingness to the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception. And when he mastered that, Brahmaputra asked Siddhartha to be his teacher, and again, Gautama declined. Now, some tales will then tell you about a third teacher that he went to. However, in the tale that I'm telling you, which is, of course, the correct one, he was still not satisfied and he settled down in the little town of Gaia and began a series of austerities. The austerities he practiced in the hopes of learning the truth about existence of humankind's ills. The austerities consisted of self-mortification, even more severe than the preceding ones with his other teachers. And these included many yogic practices that he learned along the way, including such things as holding his breath until a roaring sound arose in his ears, living on a small quantity of juice squeezed from beans and peas. That must have been really, I talk about being austere, that to me is it's right there, even though there's beans. <laughs> and various postures that caused him great pain and stress. Oh my God. After a period of time, he expressed to his five companions, his father had sent five companions to accompany him, basically to keep an eye on him because I didn't go into the whole thing about his father. Well, I, I, I talked about his later, but he, the five companions ended up becoming his disciples at this point. And Shakyamuni Buddha said to these five disciples, 
What useless anguish of body and mind. What a waste of time and effort. I've spent six years like a man trying to tie the air into knots. I love that phrase. That's why I tell this whole story. He asked his associate to take him to his hut so that he could continue, so that he could eat rice gruel. And the companions were so disgusted that he would be, that he would go and he would have something to eat. Can you imagine that they left him, uh, believing that there was no longer they no longer deserved to be his, their teacher? And so we get on to the bodhi, the awakening. Is it hard to recognize with the austerities and practices that had not provided what he was seeking? And he went to the grove of solid trees near the Narajana River to sit in meditation. And at that time, he was still suffering from the results of the austerities. And a milkmaid, Sujata, placed a dish of milk rice in his hands and left. He went to the river, ate the milk rice, bathed in the river, and returned to sit under a people tree later become known as the Bodhi tree. Now, there's some discussion as to whether it was Siddhartha himself who realized the middle way, leading to a sitting under the tree, or was it Sujata, who had demonstrated compassion and dana, or generosity, that led him to recognize the middle way. And that's worth a discussion all in of itself how this simple milkmaid was responsible ultimately for Shakyamuni Buddha's teachings. We often don't put some of these other characters into perspective. We look at it as, you know, what, what historians call the great man theory of history, that there's a great person who did something and everything. We don't look at some of the other characters who are responsible. <clears throat> Seated under the sheaves of soft grass, on sheaves of soft grass, under the Bodhi tree, said, Hart to utter a mighty resolution. Let only the skin and bones remain. The flesh and blood of this body dry up, but I shall not abandon the seat until I have attained supreme and absolute enlightenment of Buddhahood. <clears throat> well, there's a little bit of megalomania there, but we'll, we'll ignore that. <clears throat> During this period of time, Siddhartha Gautama sat and was assaulted by Mara, an army of demons. He fought mightily and stretched his right hand toward the earth, and Gautama touched the ground with the tips of his finger. A mighty thundering at once arose from the depths of the solid earth, and an invincible, invincible roar overwhelmed the armies of Mara and the tremendous utterance of, I, earth, bear you witness. He said into the night. Following this came the Mara of lust in the form of three beautiful maidens. And he proclaimed that he had become a renunciant and would not succumb to some temptation. Whereupon Mara, dejected, let his loot slip down and he passed away from his sight. And we have equanimity. Depending upon the story one chooses, one can go into many permutations of what happens next. Most of these accounts are legends, cultural interpretations, and post facto elaborations to legitimize the teachings. But let's just say that the fact is reflected in that he found the middle way, which avoids the two extremes of pleasure and self-torture, and it implies mental equipoise through meditation. And by the way, this scroll, this Japanese scroll, is a depiction of Shunyata. Now, I enjoy the legends and mythologies as much as the next person, or maybe more than the next person in some cases. And they provide a great way to inspire a background for the teaching for us today. But it's important that we recognize that awakening is not a kind of miracle or supernatural event. And it's also important to remember that while we commemorate the awakening, of Shakyamuni Buddha. It is his teachings and how we live our lives every day, his teachings of equanimity in the middle way, his meditations that we conduct as Shikan that are the most important. <clears throat> Shakyamuni Buddha means sage of the Shakyas, and Shakya being the name of the clan to which his family belonged. 
and we venerate him as the identifiable Buddha from 2,500 years ago who established the path toward awakening that we follow. There have been many bodhisattvas and other awakened beings since then, and we admire and honor him as a way to encourage us to live better lives and a better way of being. Now, that's the story. But let me expand a little bit on the narrative that's traditionally offered. And I ask the question, I won't ask the question. <laughs> what led Shakyamuni Buddha, uh, Siddhartha Gautama, to seek awakening? Siddhartha, Siddhartha Gautama was born as a prince in the Shakya clan, the Sakya clan, in the Kasala province in what is today Nepal. He was a son of elected noble of the clan. Most people don't realize that he wasn't a hereditary prince. His father had been elected. And people don't often catch that, that the kingdom that he lived in had a form of democracy. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind that at this time, the kingdoms were really small. We're not talking about England or Japan or something like that. This was a, a an area, how many people lived in the kingdom? Maybe several thousand, maybe 10,000, but nothing the size of what you would expect uh, by comparison today. And he was a member of the Kastria, or the rulers, administrators, and the warrior caste. When we talk about being elected, you would only be elected from one of the from the from the caste of those people who were administrators, warriors, or um, rulers in general. So there was an election, but not everybody could run. If you were a merchant, you weren't going to run for election. You had to be one of those folks. The other aspect of this is he was a member of the Kastria, uh caste. There were, there were four castes plus the untouchables. His father kept him isolated in the palace, and he ventured out and was exposed to the four conditions which afflict every living person. So he had been, he had a life of privilege and affluence. And he was married to Yasodora, who bore him a son, Raula. And you'll, you've heard the name Raula many times because he had two attendants as Shakyamuni Buddha. One was his son, Raula, and the other was Ananda. And many people are not aware that Raula was actually his son. Now, some canon tell us that Raula was his cousin. Some say that it was, Ananda, that was his cousin. We don't know, but there it is. And he was married and had a son, and he secreted himself out of the palace to assume the life of Shramana, as we said before. That's the basic Bones version of the story, and there are many variations. What I'd like to focus on is that Siddhartha Gautama was seeking, as Akira defined it, as seeing things as they actually are, or as I phrase it, the search for the nature of reality. The young man left a life of privilege and wealth to become a mendicant with the robes on his back, a begging bowl to obtain food, and little else. Sleeping in the groves, he was what we would call today homeless. He spent his time performing austere practices that included yoga, meditation, and philosophical discourse. Not on retreats or weekly meditation sessions, but as his life. Ram Prasad Chanda posited that the practice of asceticism could be linked to the initiatory phases of seclusion and abstinence observed by shamans. And there are some who claim that the term shaman came from shramana, which is really interesting when you think about it. That's not, that's, that's, those who study such things, that's that's a discussion they like to sit around and have. <laughs> Some scholars maintain that the practice <clears throat> is distinct and separate cultural and religious tradition from the Vedic tradition, away from the Vedic tradition, while others suggest that the original shamanic tradition was part of the Vedic one. We don't know really which one Siddhartha Gautama uh, practiced. 
It's safe to say that such devotion is remarkable. By today's standards, it may be considered reason for a mental health evaluation. I want you to think about that. I, I say that, and it's not totally tongue-in-cheek. What would you think if you saw a fellow wandering around in robes, coming to your door and saying, do you have any food without a home? How would you treat that guy? Give him some meat. Maybe. But I would say that you might be one of the few. I'm not talking about necessarily in this room, but in general. And they would probably call the police and say, there's some crazy guy over here. What are we going to do about it? So when I say that we would probably send him for a mental health evaluation, that's not kidding. That's true when you think about it. But it's, and as remarkable as it may seem, there were a fair number of people at that time who became shamana. And today, if you go to India, there's still shamana that are doing the same thing. The main question I ask is, why was Siddhartha different? That's the question. You had all of these religious leaders. As a matter of fact, one that we still recognize today from that same period of time was the founder of the Jains, Mahavira, who was the 24th or last Triyakankara, one of the most influential teachers of the Jains. He's the one that is most often worshipped, but he was considered the last of this lineage. He was Mahavira was slightly older than Shakyamuni Buddha, but they were contemporaries. I'm, I don't know that they ever met each other. They were contemporaries. So why was Shakyamuni Buddha different? That's my question. And I really, and when I say that I meditated on this, that's not a, that's, I, I mean that literally. My answer to the question, what led Shakyamuni Buddha to seek awakening in the fashion that he did, is that he was intent on an issue not addressed by all the others. The yogas, the guru, and the other teachers were focusing on or rejecting or modifying a pre-existent belief. Shakyamuni Buddha was specifically looking for what is the nature of reality? And that's a very different question than the others were attempting to answer. They were looking at enlightenment as a way to enter eternal bliss. He was looking at awakening to find out what is the nature of reality. And you'll find in the Mahayana Sutras, that's where that question is really discussed. It's not answered always, because the answer to that has to come through your meditations and other methods. <clears throat> but the question is, what is the nature of reality? And that's what he sat under the Bodhi tree to discover. At least that's my answer. And here are some of the sources that I used. <clears throat> And I'm going to skip the, the uh, questions and comments and go directly to the, I'll go back to that. And I want to do a quote for today that I was thinking of what can I, what would I find that Shakyamuni Buddha might agree with today? And it came from Toni Morrison. Please don't settle for happiness. It's not good enough. Of course, you deserve it. And if that's all you have in mind, happiness, I want to suggest to you that personal success, devoid of meaningfulness, free of steady commitment to search of justice, that's more than a barren life. It's a trivial one. Ichishima Sensei, do you have anything to add to my presentation? Thank you. Uh, Buddha Shakyamuni really told us everything is changing. Uh, so 
everything is changing. Uh, you see, that is a very basic uh, understanding. And uh, so we call it the shimujo for uh, non-eternal things. So much uh, we, we our life is also not eternal. But the uh, Buddha Shakyamuni got idea or well, enlightened under the body tree according to uh, the tradition uh, eighth of uh, uh, this year December and uh, uh, well I think uh, he really awakened that uh, uh, middle tools of course but later that uh, kind of esoteric uh, development in India uh, came to China and uh, Japan and uh, uh, this year uh, is a 1,250 years anniversary since Kukai, founder of Shingon Esoteric Buddhism in Japan, born. And uh, uh, Kukai reached to such, you know, esoteric system based upon the uh, Mahabhairochana system. And Mahabhairochana says, uh, Karuna Muran. Karuna is the compassion. Uh, compassion is a basis. And the uh, body chitta hate come, uh, uh, seeking the uh, truth mind, true mind, body chitta is hate hey to hey to, hey to come means cause, cause of understanding. And finally, upaya uh, pariyavasanam, upaya is the uh, skillful means, uh, it's the how to save people out of suffering. This is very important. And uh, so I think uh, so development of Buddhism is very interesting to see like that way. Just the, this is my uh, thought now. Thank you. Thank you, Sensei. So we're going to um, stop the recording.